Hello everybody, I'm in the workshop uh, to build a fresh bike, which is super exciting. I've got the new Nuke Proof uh, Giga 290 Carbon. I've got some really cool parts, so I'm gonna get busy and start building a brand new bike. So this is the fresh 2023 frame. This is in cosmic black. Whoa, I've seen that. Actually, that's super cool. There's a bit of like sparkle to it underneath there. So it's not just standard black. Uh, and this is a medium frame, so I'm five foot ten, about one seven eight centimeters. Uh, I've had a previous Giga medium; it suits me fine. Reach is about four five five, I think, on the medium, and it's head angle of sixty three and a half. One seventy mil travel bike, and I've got some amazing parts to go on this. So, I'm gonna get busy, start bolting things onto it. So far, so good. I'm using the SRAM access, the new transmission stuff. So that makes my life so much easier. I'm not running uh, cables and hoses, except for the rear brake hose, which I'll go through, uh, through the internal routing. I'm kind of using some bits I already have that I've been I've used before. So I've um, got to change the length of the hoses probably when it comes to my brake levers. And I'm just kind of bolting everything on loose at the moment, I'm trying to get the angles there or thereabouts for kind of bar roll and stuff like that just to try and get kind of hoses as close as I can to the right right length. Um, but I will always find that I'll take the bike out for the, on the trail first time and I'll be tweaking levers and bar roll and things like that. But kind of, I know kind of where I want them with bar roll is kind of in line with the fork. So I need to roll this a little bit further forward. And uh, yeah, just keep bolting stuff on really. From brake hose, because it's kind of a different bike. Um, it's kind of short with a 180 fork. I see what it looks like. I can always swap that out. After. So I've threaded the, the rear brake hose through the frame. It's got all internal sort of uh, routing for it as well. So it pops out right where you need it. I like wrapping the hoses around the head tube. So there's a nice sort of mellow bend on them over to the bar. So getting there, I need to sort the hose, the hose lengths out and then uh, sort of guts the bike and ready to go. And, uh, start on the wheels next, get some fresh tires on these wheels. New bikes, uh, new rubber as well. And these are actually brand new. So these are the Vittoria Mazza race version. So I always run Mazzas, I love them. They're just super versatile. 29, 2.6 actually, so quite big. Uh, and these are the race compounds. So I guess one thing that people say about Mazzas is they're maybe oh. rubber compounds slightly hard, but I've always liked that actually, because <laughs> they last a really long time. I'm not racing, so I don't need the softest compound, but now that I've got these, I'm uh, really stoked to try these out. So they're in the Enduro build. It's a nice, tough tire. I've got that uh, red sidewall in there as well. And yeah, so this race tire has got softer compounds, so super grippy. And uh, stick them on this Enduro bike, why not? So I'm running uh, Spank wheels, the 350 rim up front, 359 rear. I actually like aluminium wheels for a big hitting bike like this, so enjoy a bike and we're thrashing it down rough rocky mountains. I like the feel of aluminium rims, so uh, 
carbon fiber frame, everything else great, but I like the gear you get from these rims. Okay, the day is drawing to an end. Uh, I've only got a couple more things to do. We've got a fit chain, trim the rear brake hose, bleed the brakes, and then I can't wait to ride this thing tomorrow. So there it is, my new proof Giga out in the sunshine. Uh, I absolutely love it. It's proper stealth compared to the yellow bike that I, it was before this. So I did a frame swap, but obviously I've done quite a few upgrades as well, like I've spoke about already. I've set it up, I've done a few tweaks already. So actually I've swapped out some of the sort of brake mounting bolts, put some titanium bolts in there. They hardly save any weight, but I think they look proper cool. It makes the bike look factory. And now I've set it up, so just about to take it out for a ride. Um, with these enduro tyres, soft compound, I've gone for 25 psi up front, 28 psi in the rear. The fork came off the other bike, so I've not changed pressure at all. I've got 180 psi in the Float X2 rear shock, and I've adjusted all the sort of settings on there from the manual basically. So it tells you, you know, according to how much pressure you put in, how many clicks you want, the low speed rebound and high speed rebound and the same for the compression so loads setting on the shock pretty much ready to roll uh, bars are cut to 760 i've kind of filled around with these uh, pod controllers for the axis stuff to get them in the right spot feels pretty good i've got this new proof mount here basically for a strap so i can put some some plugs and a co2 canister on there for when i'm doing the bigger rides don't necessarily need that today uh, i think that's it i think it's ready to roll Oh, loving it. All feels really good. Actually, setup feels pretty spot on already. I reckon I need to do a little uh, bolt check. I always feel like linkages need checking the first time you ride, but it feels great. The tyres feel super grippy. I might feel like I want to put the enduro, the sort of the non-race ones, back on for normal riding. They feel super, super grippy, but maybe like a little bit too draggy for most of my riding. So maybe keep them for the racing. Who knows? But. I'll leave them on for now. The conditions are absolutely prime. It's been so dry and it's just had a little dust in the rain. It feels so grippy at the moment. So uh, stoked on the new bike. Uh, let me know what you think down below and uh, what adventures you think I should take it on. I've actually not planned any racing this year so far. So uh, maybe I should think about that. Weight in mountain biking has always been a hot topic and no more so than the world of XC. Now, having known to dabble in a bit of racing and the odd epic in my time, I put weight really high up in the list of priorities when it comes to my bike. So it got me thinking, with a few challenges coming up this year, just how light could I build my bike? So why would you want to make your bike as light as possible? Well, in certain disciplines, things like downhill and enduro, there's actually the argument that you definitely would not. You don't want to sacrifice things like strength or durability. However, in XC, where every gram counts and a heavier bike means more energy used to get the thing moving, surely lighter is better. The starting point then on my quest to crush the kilos is this, my Orbea Oys M-Team XC bike, already a very capable machine. However, I want to make it lighter, which is hopefully going to make it faster and means I can go further. But don't worry, I'm under no illusion that I am pretty tough on bikes, so it does need to be sturdy as well. 
Here we are then people in the tech set and ready to rock. Now the bike in the stand as you see it is 12 kilos on the dot surprisingly. So I think let's get started, let's take off the bits we're not gonna need and really dive into this ultra lightweight build. First big saving then, this bottle cage is off, carbon one's gonna go on, there's a 237 gram difference there. So Mr. Editor, take that weight off. I've taken the spares off as well, that's another 205 grams off of the counter there. Now I am aware that obviously on some of the epic rides that some of this stuff may go back on, but for XC racing especially, that stuff's staying off. So I'm switching out the drivetrain on this for access. We'll get to that in a little bit, but we're gonna get rid of the uh, original stuff on there at the moment, then we're gonna move on to the wheels, which actually is a humongous one. The wheels are a huge area where weight can be saved. So I said before, when it comes to weight saving and performance, there are huge gains to be had when it comes to wheels and tires. So for this, I'm using these bad boys. These are Biker Head Composites 26 XC wheels, weighing a staggering 1100 or so grams a wheel set. Insane, they're regarded as one of the lightest weight wheels out there. Now combine that with Vittoria XC race casing tires, those are about 690 grams. No, we're not going tubeless, people. No, we're actually going super lightweight inner tubes. These are Tubalito inner tubes. They're around 85 grams per tube. That's over 100 grams lighter than a standard inner tube. And across the course of a tubeless system, we're probably gonna save about 200 grams. So if we combine the wheels, the tires, the taking off the spares, even just swapping out the bottle cage, we've saved over a kilogram in weight already. Boom, pump her up. The wheels are done and I've stuck them to one side then. Now we're gonna replace the fork. So the 34s are going and a RockShox SID Ultimate is going on. No real difference in weight, but I love how a RockShox feels. And also they're a 35 mil stanchion, so they're a little bit stiffer on the ride as well when I really do hammer them hard. So let's get these off and get the new ones on. Okay, forks are in. Now, it was a bit of a process because what you've got to do, bar and stem's got to come off and I've actually, the way that the hosing's rooted, I've rerouted the hose, the rear brake through, the rear hose if you like. So that's ready to go now. Forks are good, steer is cut to the right length, everything's where it should be. So now it's time to move on to the cockpit. And actually for the cockpit, I've got something pretty special. So these are the old bars, these are the new ones. There's 30 grams difference. These have got Zerbel, access shifters built into them. So 
30 grams heavier, but actually already got two shifters on them. So overall, a much bigger saving. This one's got me excited, people. So the brakes that I've gone for are half of the weight of the previous brakes. They are trick stuff picklers. Weighing in at around 316 grams for the pair, they are ridiculously light. I've already threaded the back one on because I needed to do that to get the hosing through to change out the bars uh, on there. Front one, primed and ready here. So let's get to work on uh, putting the brakes on. But that, Mr. Editor, is another 300 grams off of our weight, please. Okay, the wheels are on then. So now it's time to move on to the drivetrain. There's very little difference in weight here, so there's virtually no change in the counter. So let's get that fit. Okay, blip box is now on and looking pretty tidy at the front there. The mech hasn't actually turned up in the post yet, so we're gonna move on to all the contact points. Okay, so I've binned off the dropper. I just feel that they're often not needed. And for maximum weight saving, this has saved me over another 350 grams. So Mr. Editor, take that off of our counter. But I'm still waiting on the flipping mech. So we'll have to check back in in a bit. Right, it's the grand way in time, people. The bike is built and finished, and I am pretty impressed with it. It's, it's a stunning looking build. So, I've not weighed it yet, so this is gonna be brand new for both of us, and let's see what we've got. Hold her steady, Rich. What are we saying? 9.71 kilos, not sub 10 kilos for 120 mil full suspension XE bike. That's absolutely insane. So bear in mind, this is a size large and that's with pedals as well. Bonkers, I cannot wait to get this bike out on the trails, do some XE racing and get exploring on it. Look, let me know what you think of my build in the comments down below. I'm absolutely gagging to know what you guys reckon. If money was no object, I'm sure we could make it even lighter. Would you change any parts? Again, let me know. But I think it's about time we took this beast for an absolute spin. Keep your eyes peeled for it in the videos in the future, but me and Ron Burgundy, we're out of here. Thanks for watching and I'll see you later. Shimano has asked me to build my ideal mountain bike and that's really got me thinking. And overthink and then even think some more. Twenty-nine inch, twenty-seven and a half inch carbon. No alloy. Enduro. No trail. Trouble is, once someone gives you free reign to build whatever you want, it gets carried away with crazy ideas. So I've gone with the heart. 
instead. Oh. Yep. Yep. Well, it had to be really, didn't it? Subliminally, I think uh, I've had Yeti going through my head for a while now. So this was the perfect choice. Shimano wanted me to build my ultimate bike. Um, and we're going to start by using this frame. Uh, let's get it in the workstand and I'll explain a bit more. Okay, so this is the frame I've chosen for my Shimano Ultimate bike build. It's a Yeti SB100. It's got 100mm travel on the back end. It uses a Switch Infinity system. It has 29 inch wheels. It's super light and it's that Yeti turquoise colour that I love so much. I'm guessing it's a bit of a Marmite thing. Um, am I right? I love it. I've always loved it. And actually, there's quite a lot of things in the house that are this colour just by chance. My workshop floor, I didn't get it because it was this colour, but it's near enough the Yeti turquoise colour. The sort of the fake leather seating we've got on our breakfast bench that I built. That is near enough the same colour as well. Even the salt and pepper grinders have got elements of that in it. And, and actually in the front room, I've got a Rick James print. I love Rick James. I love my old phone console and stuff. Um, the tune Super Freak, we've got a print on the wall and it's yellow and near enough, yes, he blue. But why have I gone for a bike with 100mm travel, I hear you ask? Well, in the whole lockdown period over the last few months, it's kind of simplified things for me. Now, at GMBN, we got a lot of different bike partners. We get to work with a lot of cool people. And as a result, there's always cool bikes floating around to ride. There's a few just out of shot. But actually, there's only been one bike I've really been riding, and that's been my Canyon Cross Country bike. Now, that's really a super lightweight cross country race bike. It's got XTR on it, you know, it's got all of that sort of stuff. And it's just made me love riding in a totally different way, kind of like when I first fell in love with mountain biking. The rolling hills, the sun, the long climbs, the bike that just would glide along single track, a bike that needed taming when you started riding technical stuff. Don't make anything easy for you, you've got to take control of that. And with 29 inch wheels now, a 100mm travel bike, to me, is near enough perfect. And this bike is gonna be that bike, I hope. But I am gonna make a few changes to it. I want it to have slightly longer travel on the front, to have slightly heavier tires, maybe better brakes, a few other bits and pieces I'm gonna change just to make it a bit more me than an out and out cross country race bike. So what am I gonna put on the bike? I've got all these cool choices of Shimano componentry. So I guess you're thinking as a GMBN tech presenter, I'm gonna go for DI2, right? Nah, nah, not my kind of thing. The R2 is phenomenal. The shifting is so clean, so fast, so punchy. So race as well. That's not me at all. Neil's always had the R2 on his cross country bikes and I've always been secretly envious of it. Um, it's incredible to use, but I just love the simplicity of mechanical transmissions. Uh, don't get me wrong, I really do appreciate tech, but this isn't the right bike for it. Uh, not the right time, not the right bike. So you might be thinking, oh, we'll go for XTR. No, you're wrong again. XTR is XT racing. I'm not building a race bike. I'm building a bike that I want to love riding. So there can only be one choice for me, and that is XT. Now, when I started mountain biking, XT was and still is the workhorse. XT is what you put on your bike if you want the maximum value for performance. It's what you put on your bike for fit and forget. So for that reason, it's going on this bike. Simples. Up front, of course, I had to go for the top of the line Fox Fork, didn't I? I've got the 34 step cast option on there, 120 more travel, the Fit 4 damper on the inside. And instead of going for the 51 rake that you tend to see on short travel bikes like this, I went for the 44. Now, yet you do spec the 44 on other bikes, and I've observed that, like, it's a good thing the bike is designed around that. I mean, you're talking a pretty rowdy, aggressive little cross country bike here. Um, it's right up my street. Now I base my build around what Yeti spec as a T1. So although I've done mine from the frame up and built it myself, it's got some pretty similar parts in there to be fair. Uh, kept the 50 mil stem, that works great for me, but put a bigger 800 mil bar on there. Gone for the carbon Proline Tharsis bar. Uh, it's got a slight bit of flex on it, which suits me down to the ground, it's really comfortable. Uh, as with carbon, the frame and the bars, we've obviously got to install everything correctly. So I'm using anti-seize compound on the bars there. Uh, you might have seen that I'm also using a primer on the bottom bracket shell and a press fit retaining compound. This thing is gonna be silent, no creaks at all. 
Um, of course, I'm using the torque wrench on there. Uh, and also with the XT stuff, I've actually hopped up to a 34 tooth chainroom because the 30 that they come with a stand is just not quite big enough for the places I ride and a lightweight bike like this. I've also put a chain guide on it, interestingly. Now, you don't really tend to lose chains much these days, but I love the little security you get, especially from a minimal one like this. And the cool thing about the XTR chain guide is it's got a trim adjustment, which means no messing around with spacers. Thank you, Shimano. For the wheels, though, I've stuck with a pair of DTs, so the 1700s. Uh, they've got the ratchet drive hubs, which are really good, really good for rebuilding. Uh, there's not much friction in them, they're reliable as anything. And the alloy wheels, well, they kind of suit me because I'm not that kind on wheels. And if I'm if I'm honest, like um, there's not that much difference with carbon ones. You can get crazy light ones, but this bike is not about being crazy light. With the brakes, though, I've gone for a four pot on the front with a regular two pot on the rear. It's just given a braking bias with the 124 and kind the of bigger, grippier tires and stuff. It just makes more sense to be able to slow me down that bit more. But well, there we go, it's 12 speed, it's got the workhorse on there. A bit more of a refined approach for a bike like me, I think. Um, I tend to normally go for 130 mil bikes, 140 mil bikes, but in the last few months, I've definitely changed my sort of pitch a bit. And 100 mil travel, it just feels great. It's more than enough travel for what I really want out of a bike, but I don't know, I just, I can't wait to ride the thing now, but, um, well, it's been a while since I've done a full bike build, that's for sure. But, uh, oh man, I love it. It's such a nice experience. If you get the chance to build a bike from the frame up, then do it because there's something very therapeutic and very satisfying about it. I think I might just sit back and uh, have a look at it, I think. You know what that means, don't you? But uh, well, cheers to today. And here's to uh, plenty of single track tomorrow, I reckon. Oh, first outing on a fresh bike, always the best. Biking is more than just blazing along single track for me. It clears my head if I'm stressed out. It cheers me up when I'm down. It's my vessel for health and headspace. And that's why I love this sort of riding on this sort of bike. Yeah, I love my tech, I like my details. That's why I built the bike. But really, the thing that really makes me tick is just getting out there in the wilderness and actually leaving all that stuff behind. It's in this cow like this Kashima coating. Biking for me has always been about riding more or less out the front door and living, I mean, look around me, this place is beautiful. I live in the hills around Bath, I can be tires in dirt five minutes from my front door. 
But I haven't always had that luxury, but it's made me consider the sort of bikes I really want to ride. A lightweight 100mm travel frame is literally perfect for me. 120 on the front, call it down country if you want. I just call it a cross country bike. It just makes the bike feel a little bit more controllable, more comfortable to ride. Again, the bigger brake on the front, as I mentioned when I was building it, I've got the, the forepot on the front. It just affords me a bit more control. It's not about out and out braking power. It's about being able to control the bike in the terrain that I ride on. I guess you could say it's kind of why I like XT so much because it's transmission that you just fit it and forget it. You know, all right, so in the UK, you'll probably change your inner derailleur cable once a year, maybe twice if you ride in loads of gunky conditions. You need to bleed the brakes every now and then and change your brake pads, but pretty much it's fit and forget. I don't want to be messing around. I talk about bikes all day long. I don't want to be messing around having to fine tune stuff constantly. I just want to get a good bike, get on it and ride it. And that is exactly what this is. Yeah, it's got a bit of a, a luxury frame, fork and rear shock on there. But the rest of the stuff is no frills, it's no fuss. Fit and forget, just the way I like it. Rolling hills, natural beauty. This really is what mountain biking has always been about for me. Don't get me wrong, I've been to Whistler like 10, 15 times. I love bike parks as much as the next person, but realistically, that's, that's a holiday. That's not life for me. You know, I can pedal out my doorstep and have 20 miles of this on the doorstep. It's just, I've always, always appreciated it. And because of that, choosing the right bike has been a necessity. You know, I like the six inch travel bikes. They're good, but, they're slow, they're not as nice to climb. I like climbing, weirdly. Call me a sadist if you want, but I actually like the challenge of getting up something that's really hard. I like the challenge of something that's physically quite disgusting, to be fair. There's something about it. And actually, in this whole lockdown period, it's only highlighted it even more how much I like this style of riding. I like riding my own. I like riding with my friends as well, but I like the peace of mind. I like the peace and quiet, and actually having a lot of the countryside to myself has just been amazing. I guess in a roundabout way, you could kind of compare mountain bikers to surfers. A surfer might spend his or her life searching for the ultimate wave. They might travel the world to try and find that ultimate wave, or they might surf the same break for years trying to get the ultimate ride. Mountain biking is the same for me. I love traveling the world to try new trails and find that thing that I really love. But equally, I love riding my home trails. I love my doorstep riding. And to be honest, in, in modern times, it's become more obvious to me that that is really where my passion is for riding. Short travel bikes, big wheels, feeling connected to the terrain, and being able to ride anything I fancy with no hindrance. That's where it's at. Usually about now in the videos, we start telling you what's going on and start wrapping things up a bit. But uh, well, if I'm completely honest, I was having such a good time riding the bike that I actually completely forgot to do that. So, uh, well, enjoy looking at me, looking at the bike I built instead. Uh, but seriously, if you like this video and you like this slightly different approach, uh, let us know what you think in those comments. Earlier on in the year, I rode a 26 inch bike, a downhill bike. Uh, it's a little bit old, but I absolutely loved it. And it got me thinking about how I could build my very own budget downhill bike build, because I think this can still be the ultimate bike park bike. So today I'm gonna use parts I've begged, borrowed, haven't st uh, stolen any, but trying to build a really cheap downhill bike. 
Right, so the parts, I've actually bought this Nuke-proof scalp downhill bike off Facebook Marketplace. This cost me £90 without the shock, but it was super cheap. Uh, it's in really good condition. It's an old aluminium frame. I know these were really good angles back in the day as well. So I think this is gonna be a great bike. So what I wanted to do today is basically to use some of my old parts. I have bought some bits. Really the only new parts I have bought are tires and I have got some brand new wheels. I've actually blagged those off one of our channel sponsors. But kind of the idea of this is basically, you know, not everyone needs a downhill bike. If you're racing downhill, then they're great. They're the fastest things out there. But if maybe you've got a trail bike and a few times a year you want to go to a bike park or you go to Whistler or the Alps or whatever, then it's really hard to build, uh, to beat a downhill bike for doing those sorts of things. Just the extra travel, the angles, they're so good. But it's like a crazy expense just to have a bike that you ride a few times a year. For me, particularly, I don't really ride downhill bikes very much. So that got me thinking about doing this completely on the cheap. And the build today is gonna sort of back that up. Um, I've got 26 inch wheels, so that's what this bike is. I've also, I'm going for single speed because this is going to be really a jump bike. I love that bike. When I came to throw it around in the air, that retro bike that I rode at W Bike Park, it was the best thing. It was even better than riding, you know, the latest, greatest downhill bikes, because in the air, the 26 wheels are just so good. So single speed as well. I'm not going to use it for racing. I don't need those gears. I'm not going to risk smashing off mechs. So this could be a great idea if you're just trying to get a bike park shredding bike yourself. Do it on the cheap. All I need is two brakes, single speed. So let's get to it. I'm just, uh, sort of talk you through the bits that I've got, what I've done to them, because I've actually got a 26 inch RockShox Boxer that I took off that cheap bike. I've had it refurbed, I've had it serviced, so that, you know, there's some expense involved with some of these parts, but like I say, I'm trying to do this as cheap as I possibly can. So this is the old RockShox Boxer that came off that Da Vinci bike that I rode earlier in the year. Uh, and I've had this service by Full Factory Suspension and Finn, the guy there said, this is probably the worst set of forks he's ever seen. So inside was full of muddy water. So you can see they're a bit, bit scrappy, but the stanchions are perfect. It's got new seals, been serviced internally. So actually they feel really good. You know, it cost me a hundred quid, hundred pounds to get them serviced, but they are feeling fresh. So let's start building the bike. So these brakes, I've had knocking around for probably about five years now. They've been on a few different bikes. So they kind of haven't cost me anything because they, you know, they're old brakes. So I do like to do that, just keep hold of stuff. You know, not everyone has the same sort of uh, look on things. I guess some people want to sell stuff when they're not using it to get a bit more money back. But these are kind of old, they're still really good brakes, but they've been used quite heavily. So for me, these really haven't cost anything. But Hopefully by the end of this video, I'll give you a bit of an idea of how much this bike could cost if you're gonna try and build it yourself. Matching colors. That's gonna look pretty good, I think. So 
So I've gone for single speed setter kit for this bike because I think it's going to be really good. Just the sort of neatness of just having two brakes on this bike and nothing else. I think I'm going to want this bike to just throw around on jumps. It's going to be so much fun. And you really don't need more gears than that. It'd be nice to just get used to pedaling one cadence as well, but it's not going to work for everybody. I guess if your bike part's got some pedaling or you need to like transfer around a bit, then it's not great, but I love the idea of it. I've actually borrowed this single speed conversion kit off Blake. Uh, so this is a reverse components tensioner, I believe. I'm not 100% sure. I've got a 13 tooth sprocket. So you're going to need a tensioner on a full suspension bike because the chain uh, tension will move around. If it was your yeah, hardtail, you don't need to, but I will have to stick that on. But it's super small, super neat, so it'll look cool anyway. But I think it's time to dig out the wheels and start building them. Really helpfully for me, uh, not so helpfully for you, because I can't tell you about trying to do this on cheap, but I have actually got some brand new wheels because fortunately one of our partners uh, Spank still make 26 inch wheels for uh, jump bikes and all sorts. So these are a brand new set of the Spank Race 33s. Look how small they look, they look tiny to me. But alloy rims, exactly what I want for this bike. Uh, small wheels are gonna be so good for throwing around in the air. Well, I know that I've done it already, but yeah, some brand new wheels for this bike. So stoked on that one. <laughs> Grease, so lovely the colour that is. There it is, finished, built. This is my 2014 Nuke Proof scalp frame. I actually can't believe how cheap I was able to do this. I know I've kind of, you know, 
I've got some stuff lying around that I've put on this, but like I said, the frame cost 90 pounds, found that on eBay. Uh, the shock was 120 quid, that came off Facebook Marketplace. What else, tires, about 100 quid for the pair, that's actually not as cheap as I kind of would have hoped for some 26 inch uh, downhill tires. Cranks, 200 quid. Uh, they're a brand new Shimano Saints, but obviously super up the job, super strong. Single speed kit would be about 80 quid. Got brand new spank wheels. These are worth about 500 pounds, but you could definitely save money today. Uh, get on eBay some alloy 26 inch downhill bike wheels. I bet you could get some of those for bargain price. Obviously with alloy rims, I think, They'll bend a bit, but normally, you know, you're running discs. You don't, they don't need to be perfect. Like I said, I reckon you find them super cheap. I've got old bars. The stem actually I swapped to find that direct mount stem uh, that came with the boxer. The boxer came off that uh, Da Vinci bike that cost 500 pounds. So, you know, I reckon I could sell the rest of that bike for probably 400 quid. So that fork's probably cost about 100 pounds. Yes, I've spent 100 pounds on the service in the fork and the shock, but they feel brand new. It feels amazing, like the geometry of the bike, like it's not that old, 2014. I think it's like a 62 and a half, 63 degree head angle, so nice and slack. Suspension feels like fantastic, considering how old it is. Like it's been serviced, it feels new, brakes feel great. The bike on the drop test, just brilliant. Like single speed, it's completely silent. Um, I think this bike is gonna rip and I can't wait to ride it. And I definitely encourage you, if you don't want to go out and buy a, a, you know, a downhill bike that you're not going to use very much, this could be the way to do it. And I think you could easily get a bike like this for under £800. If, you, you know, if you're careful, find the parts. Definitely, I would say go for like a not too old, but an alloy frame that isn't too old. The geometry will be pretty good. You could always size up if you want a slightly bigger bike. I think you could do it for well under £800. Quid. I reckon you could do it for probably £500. But... Let us know if you're inspired. I definitely am. I can't wait to ride this thing and uh, leave me some comments down below. What do you think? I think it looks amazing. What a beautiful location and a beautiful bike to match. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's take it back to the beginning first. <laughs> So Shimano have asked me to build the perfect bikepacking rig and it got me thinking what a broad term bikepacking really is because at first I was thinking I should do a flyweight, minimal setup, point to point in record time, sleeping in ditches in a glorified bin bag type of bike with full XTR group set and a filed down toothbrush to match. But that's not really me. I'm a mountain biker. I only started this sport so I could explore the hills beyond those buildings and escape this bustling energy. I like to go places I've never been with no idea of what I'll see. To ride long distances, but slowly so I can drink in the views. I want to go somewhere quiet, perhaps the top of a Munro where I can watch the sunset from on high. So I need a rig that can handle a proper rocky mountain pass or a rough British bridleway. I need something sturdy, comfortable and a drivetrain that can go the distance. You know what? I know just the thing. So this is the Souther Spearfish. It's a 120 mil down country bike, carbon, but it's super boost. So it's got all the dance moves of a cross country bike and all the conviction of a trail bike. It's got oodles of frame space thanks to the position of the rear suspension. But even this small full size frame takes two water bottles. In fact, it's fast becoming a favorite amongst long distance off-road bike packers. So much so that Salsa now do their own custom frame bag. I'm so excited to ride this, but I'm actually even more excited to build it. So enough waffle, let's get on with it.
So for this build, I don't need Shimano's racing drivetrain. I need their most hardest working, most durable drivetrain. And that is Shimano Dior XT, metallic body on the shifter here, great bearing life. And my favorite thing is the crank set can come in 165 millimeter crank arms, perfect for me. And I can fit a 28 tooth chain ring on there for all that hill spinning I'm gonna be doing. So this is a dream build after all. So I've gone with XTR brakes, uh, but I've gone for the four part trail edition because it comes with a metal lever. I can sort of adjust the lever on the fly, metal body as well. So it's gonna be super reliable when all of my packs are on the front. And basically I've been running these on my Enduro bike for years and I absolutely love them. So it had to be XTR trail. Going for the Ergon GA3 with some little mini wings for wrist support. I thought I'd give it a go. I've never tried them before, but it seems appropriate for a bike packing build. sunny but it's definitely not the city this is the Brecon Beacons the perfect place to test a flat bar bike packing rig
Wow, what a stunning location and what a stunning bike. Honestly, the salsa has reminded me how much I love split pivot. I mean, it manages to isolate the suspension from the braking forces and the pedaling forces. So it's really supportive on the climbs, but I can drag brake down a descent if I want to, and that suspension still works. Now to match that split pivot, I've gone with Fox Performance. I didn't need factory. Performance is absolutely spot on. And to be honest, uh, black stanchions and black lowers look amazing with a stealth black setup. I've also got the Pro Discovery bike packing bags up here, uh, as well as the Salsa custom frame bag. And they're doing a really nice job. I particularly like my Pro Discovery nose bag on the front here, which has got all my snacks in it. And of course, at the heart of this build is Shimano Dior XT. And as I said, I don't need XTR, uh, most of all because I'm not racing, but because XTR focuses on being light, whereas I need a focus to be on durability. So Shimano Dior XT is for me. Something that gives me a, an unreasonable amount of uh, satisfaction is my cockpit, actually. I've gone for a Pro Tharsis cockpit handlebar and stem. I really wanted a dropper post on this rig uh, because of where I'm taking it. So I've got a Topeak DP mount here, which keeps the seat pack away from the stanchion of my dropper. Sadly, being five foot one means I don't get much clearance from my seat pack and my tire. And finally, because you might have noticed uh, that I've got some unusual wheels here, uh, I did want some DT Swiss rims uh, and hubs for my rig, sadly they couldn't supply and Industry 9 were gonna send some over and we had some courier issues. So I borrowed these evil loopholes from a friend of mine and they're rolling on Industry 9 Hydra hubs as well. Can't get much better than that. Anyway, speaking of rolling, let's get on. <laughs> What a beautiful location and a beautiful bike to match. Last time I built a bike, Shimano asked me to build the bike that I wanted to ride then and there. So I built my idea of a cross-country bike to suit my local trails, which, if you remember, was particularly apt given when I built the bike. They've now asked me to build my ultimate do-anything bike. Something that is going to suit my local riding, but also things want to go a bit further afield and even cope with the sort of stuff in those big bike parks. And you know what? The bike I've built this time is by far the nicest bike I've ever built. Okay, I know what you're thinking. What is he going to build for his ultimate trail bike? I've got to tell you, it was an easy choice this time for once. Didn't think it was going to be when they initially asked me, but there's one bike that I've not been able to stop thinking about. Check this out, this is it. Well, I don't know if you're surprised, but there's never been such an easy choice as far as the frame goes to me. Yep, so this is a Mondraker Raze SL. It's 130mm travel, 
trail bike. Now, you may or may not know this, but I've had a thing for Mondraker bikes for many years. Um, I'll spare you all the details because there's a couple of videos that explain some of it. They're both going to be down there in the description. But essentially, back in 2014, they made a bike that revolutionized the geometry of bikes. And pretty much everything you see today, arguably, has Mondraker to thank for it. And it dramatically changed the way I could ride. And for that, I will always remember them. So I went to see them a few months back, and it was the first time I'd seen one of these frames in the flesh. I saw the prototype as well, and I got to ride one. And I was completely blown away, and I've not stopped thinking about it since. So when Shimano asked me to pick a frame, I was like, well, for starters, it's this. Right, so you've got 130 mil travel on the rear, full carbon frame, it's using their stealth carbon. I mean, look at that blade of a top tube. I absolutely love it, it's ridiculous. They developed a new method of producing carbon frames in order to make this top tube. It's like a blade, it's like a helicopter rotor blade or something, it's just... Absolutely stunning. So it uses the zero suspension system on here. So it's essentially kind of a four bar variant. Yeah, so you've got the rocker here driving the shock. But you've also got the linkage down the bottom here, which being between the bottom bracket axle and the rear axle kind of makes it a four bar. And it's a very supportive progressive linkage. So much so that the shock on here, Fox DPS, um, it barely has any compression tuning. It's a very light compression tune, so you could say it's a really efficient frame. Uh, but one really important thing to reference is it's got the mind telemetry system built in. So this one has it on the frame here, and there's also a unit to plug into a fork, so I'm going to show you that off the bike in a minute. Now, the cool thing about this is it has a GPS system in there and accelerometers and all the rest of it. It helps you get your suspension set up perfectly because it can measure where you are in the stroke front and rear on the bike tells you how much travel you're using how much travel you're not using right should you have a look at all the stuff i'm going to put on it then Okay, right, let's get this bike together then. The frame has been supplied to me with a Fox DPS shock. It's a great shock. It's got the light compression tune that suits it. Needless to say, I was gonna go for a Fox fork. Now the 36 with that grip two damper, like the factory fork, is, is just amazing. I've ridden several versions of it on different bikes. They supplied me this one with part of the mine telemetry system on it and the rest I've actually installed myself. So this is the front unit that pairs up with the rear one. It looks a little bit like a fender. It's a really discreet system, but what it offers is unreal. So more on that coming up. Okay, handlebar time. And I have gone for a Renthal fat bar carbon. This is the high rise, the 40 mil, a full 800 mil width, which I'm not gonna be trimming down. That is what I like. I love a high wide front end. Uh, I'm just gonna use a bit of carbon gripper on there. It does have like a grip texture to this, but I always tend to do this with carbon bars just because you kind of really should. Uh, just to help minimize the amount of torque on the stem there so you don't have to over torque them essentially and avoid any creaking. Now you might notice that this one is in the team issue colors, which is a nice surprise. Obviously, this is a Shimano bike build, so they were like, go whole hog. So I have. I've gone for XTR four piston brakes, and these are just a thing of beauty. They're incredibly light. They are insanely powerful. There's another little thing as well about having the XTR logo at the front of the bike on the bars. You could say that I could get very similar performance from the XT brakes, but you look down, you see the XTR. <laughs> the best of the best. Okay, time to get the bottom bracket and cranks in. A small detail on this frame that kind of glossing over a bit, but it's a threaded bottom bracket shell. Now I'm not against press fit, but threaded bottom brackets are far easier to maintain and they're far easier to install and they're far less likely to develop creaking. I'm sold. Now, although I've got XTR on the front of the bike, I'm putting a trusty XT rear mech on the bike. Um, I have a habit of clipping derailleurs and stuff, so I'm not gonna cry when I clip this one. Now this, oh, got for Industry 9 wheels. I've had my eye on a set of these for such a long time. So I've got the Hydra hubs with 0.52 degrees between engagement, 690 points of engagement. Listen to this. Oh, man. But I've actually chosen Arrow because I genuinely like the ride quality of Arrow rims. I love how the spokes thread directly into the flange of the hub there, and yet you can control the spoke via the built-in, I guess you could call it built-in nipple where it threads into the rim there. Now these rims are actually 28 hole and they're 27 millimeter in a width, so they're not the widest out there. They're not kind of like on trend as far as the wider rims go, but that's fine by me because I actually think narrower rims ride a little bit better.
I tend to have a bigger rotor on the front, in this case a 203 Ice Tech, and on the rear, I've got a 180 Ice Tech on there. My theory is, on a short travel bike, if I have too much power on the back end of the bike, I'm gonna be locking the wheel up, and when it's locked up, then you've got no braking power. Now, back on the bike, I've got an XTR cassette. Now, yes, the XTR cassette is seriously expensive. I've chosen the XTR cassette. Obviously, I wasn't under a budget constraint on this build, but I've chosen it because this is the lightest one that Shimano offer. So this is a three-piece design, titanium, steel, and alloy. Now, it weighs 365 grams. The Dior 12-speed one is 240 grams heavier. That's nearly another cassette heavier. If I could only have one XTR thing, it would be the right hand shifter. It feels great, it's got a cartridge bearing action in it, so it is just a little bit smoother. The XTR chain has got the hollow pin construction, so I've gone for an XT chain, something just a little bit more durable. Shifting performance will be the same, although obviously it's just a fraction heavier. Now I've been using SPDs since the very beginning, and well, I've got XTR, I'm a fan, what can I say? Now seat post wise, but I've gone for one-up components because I wanted a seat post that was durable, that had massive drop, and it was something that I could tune it the way I want. And then there's the Physique Alpaca saddle. Dead simple. Fits two 16 gram CO2 cartridges, um, and you've got a multi-tool in there. And time for handlebar grips. I've gone for something a little different here. I've gone for some Renthal Ultra Tacky grips and they're literally the stickiest things known to mankind. But they are incredible if, like me, you like riding with no gloves. Now, I know some people criticise me for that, and I will wear gloves for protection in the right places, but for general riding, I love the feeling of bare hands. So neat and tidy. Tell you what, that is a bike. Oh my god! Oh, it's nice to finally have it together. Got to do a little bit of setup stuff on there next, but uh, oh my days, that is probably the nicest bike I've ever built. In fact, it is the nicest bike I've ever built. That I'm talking about. Must have banged my head. Man, I cannot wait to ride this thing tomorrow. Oh, <laughs> look at it! What a bike! That right now, that is literally my perfect bike. Oh man. You might have thought that building a bike like this, I'd be off somewhere really exotic to do the riding stuff, but you know, that's just not me. I just love riding bikes anywhere. It could be doorstep, trails, back home in Bath. It could be classic spots like this. But you know, when I started riding, there wasn't really anywhere to ride. You had to go and ride and find stuff, and then you'd find other bikers and find it where they rode. These days, there's just so much. You've got waymark trails, you've got trail centers, you've got bike parks, you've got regulated trails. We're spoiled for choice, you know? Good. And a smile, tell a thousand words. <laughs> Absolutely love it. On paper, already knew this bike was going to be great. It's a personal height, built the bike. It's got the stuff on it that I specced on him myself. So now hub just as soon as you're hitting those berms. It feels amazing. I know, this is everything to me in the way I ride a bike. I want the bike to be light and responsive and to fill the ground, whether I'm hitting jumps like this or 
you know, like backsides of routes and things like that. So it's so important to me, the whole feel of a bike. <laughs> the things that are really important to me when out riding is this. You know, sometimes it's important to just take five, you know, enjoy, absorb where you are. I guess that's why the camera is so important to me and the whole photography thing. I love to sort of appreciate where I am. It forces me to spend some of my time looking for a lens. I think in this day and age with how fast paced society is, and you know, you can have different types of ride as well. You can go belting through the woods, having the best time, you know, just, you know, massaging the ground for speed and doing all that stuff. And there's other times when you can have what I call like a heads up ride, where you just chill out and just look around you. Now, you don't want it to go past too quickly. You know, I just love being in the woods. I don't know what it is about it. Maybe it's just as simple as the fact it's a reset for life, but it's probably one of the reasons I like riding short travel bikes like this so much, because it makes me feel that bit more connected to the terrain. You know, it's about the being in the woods. You know, I'm not on a steamroller, just, you know, big travel bikes smoothing out the bumps. I want to feel everything. I want to use that. You know, I think being proactive on a bike is so important to me in the way that I like to ride. And that could be, you know, being efficient in terms of pumping the backside of a jump for speed, or it could be, you know, hopping over routes to not get slowed down. You know, it's all about generating speed and momentum. And this bike, as it is, with the travel, the incomplete setup on it, is, it becomes an extension of me and the way that I ride. Everything on here I have picked specifically for a reason. The wheels, the engagement on them, the weight of the wheels, how fast they accelerate and spin up to speed. They just feel fantastic. And that combined with the ultralight cassette on the back, I mean, the XL cassette is the premium one, but it's so light considering just how big it is. And it really does help that rear suspension work better. I still don't think that I'm worthy of an XTR derailleur. I think, you know, I'll leave that for the racers out there. I'm far too terrified of destroying one. Uh, 130 mil on the rear, 150 on the front. Mondraker have always done this. Had a little bit more travel on the front. It just makes perfect sense to me in biking terms. So much more confidence on the front end there, but the back end, you really need to work it. Oh man, this bike just comes alive. As you know, uh, it's a weird thing about mountain biking because it's, it's truly something that's so close to my heart, but it can be really frustrating as well. And when you've got a hobby, it's also a career, sometimes they collide and it can be really quite testing. But you know, days like this, when you work on a project like this, build, basically build your ultimate bike, and you get to go and hammer it on some trails, makes it all worthwhile really, doesn't it? There we go. You're not going to find me happier than when I'm turning pedals, especially on a bike like this. It's just, what a great reset for the world. Now, normally, I'll probably ask you what you think of my bike at this point, but if I'm truthful, I don't really care because in my eyes, this bike is absolutely perfect. But I would like to know, what would you have built if you had the choice of doing what I did for today's video? I'll leave you to it in the comments. I'm going to go and have a bit more riding time while I can. See you later. Road cyclists love coffee, mountain bikers love beer. If there's any two stereotypes about cyclists that ring true, it's these two. There's no better way than finishing a bike ride with your mates in the pub. So we've come to a brewery right in the heart of some amazing riding trails to taste a few beers and also try to find out why mountain bikers love craft beer. Yeah, oh, do you want this telly to be off my head? There are four main components to craft beer, water, malt, hops and yeast. To make the beer, these are subjected to milling and mashing before being combined, boiled, cooled, allowed to ferment, filtered, carbonated and finally canned or kegged. 
before ending up in a pub or a bar near you. A custom bike is also a result of several components being combined to make a finished product that is greater than some of its parts. Frame, fork, wheels, tyres, handlebars, stem, drivetrain and contact points are all bolted together to make a mountain bike ready to ride and earn those pints of craft beer. And why are we at a brewery to build some new bikes? Well, it wasn't my idea, but thanks to Newt Proof, we were invited to build some brand new Scouts and they organise a venue, and who am I to argue? This is a Newt Proof Scout Mark III, a hardtail so beloved it has an owner's club and Blake is part of it. It has all new 6061 aluminium tube profiles with geometry tweaks, lower, longer with a slacker head angle and a steeper seat tube angle and all new sizes. A UDH gear hanger for simplicity, it's one by specific and it even gets a handy accessory strap mount. 27.5 and 29 are options. Of course, we aren't partaking in any alcoholic drinks before riding, we're sticking to some of the lovely non-alcoholic beer. I'm at the stage of figuring out what I need kindly someone's going to do my wheels for me. So you're cheating now then? I'm cheating. Nah, it's called help. That's not cheating, is it? Help is not cheating, is it? No. Well, I haven't, but it doesn't feel that nice. <laughs> Let me just get someone to check. Whoa, that is a nice tool. I like a ratchet. It's one of those jobs you've got to have proper tools for. Do you know what? It's the first time for everything in life. And this is the first time of me riding Manitou, Manatee, Manitou forks. Manatee is the elephant, right? <laughs> What's... It's like the underwater sea creature. There you go. I know my biology. Is that right? Ma I'm going to shut up. <laughs> a manatee is a fish. I think it's a mammal. It's a mammal. <laughs> Hey, I've got, I got a, a newborn baby that didn't sleep last night, right? It does feel like a race to see who's the most competent mechanic. And I think it's me, but we'll find out. Right, what's next? Just going on over here, Neil. One space to drive size. Yeah, both, yeah, one and one. To be honest, this is probably the best spot I've ever built a bike. I don't think I'm going to top building a bike like this so in a bar. Can we do this with every new bike we get? Just come to the brewery and do it? Yeah. Does it matter? Let us know. Hey, is that my stuff? Uh, no. Oh, wrong way around. Mama 2-4. <laughs> We're off to going, we're off to going, we're off outside to go and cut stuff because it's a bit toxic for up here. What is it you're doing? Whacking the star nut into the steering tube using a very good tool actually. Yeah. Much easier than doing it freehand. Yeah. Now that is what you call butter smooth. A bit like the colour of my frame, butter. Named it. Say hello to Buttercup. Done. I've got my discs on my wheels as well. We're, wheels are ready to roll, so I reckon I'm a couple of steps ahead. How is Neil? He's, he's done his wheels already as so. well. Yeah, look where mine look mine again done now. Help, it's not cheating, it's help. I don't even know it was a race. Brain will come with a hammer. Brain will come with a hammer, yeah. <laughs>
Also here for some beer and hardtail action, although modern day pros aren't so keen on the beers as my generation, are Newt Proof riders Elliot Heap and Adam Brayton. Watch my fingers. Watch my fingers, man. <laughs> this just fell out. Where did that come from? I didn't break that. Ben. Sorry, Ben. 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 Oh. into the messy bit of putting all the cables on so there's stuff everywhere at the moment. I'm trying to find some cable crawls yeah. that are bigger. Oh, but they're the same size. I can't tell if his stem's on back, but stem's on backwards now. Is that for bar spins? Bar spins, yeah. I didn't know it had dread. Oh, stem's on right where now? Forks are on backwards. Bloody hell, yeah, what are you doing? It's got a tip to drop on it. So yeah. Cable flush there. A four inch there. Perfect. Yeah. Every time. Every time. Every time. Here's me fitting a tire insert. Can you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Madu! Why is the back brake so stitchy? Now oh. <laughs> I'm going now. <laughs> Whilst Blake carried on with the spanner in, I sat down with the head honcho at Tiny Rebel to get some insight into the craft beer world and ask why it's so popular. Uh, why is it exploded? I think over the last kind of 10 years, certainly, I think it's, it's quite similar to food. People want kind of something different. Um, people's taste buds have, have kind of, they, they want to be challenged with um, whether, you know, when they're eating or whether they're drinking. I think that locality thing has become really important over the last few years. And I think that independent thing. And I think it's also become, a, over the last sort of shorter period, it's become quite trendy for some to kind of drink beer. You know, it's kind of cool to be seen in these bars. Not to be seen, I think the bars popping up everywhere are quite, quite different from your sports bars and things like that. And it can offer something a bit different. And I just think that goes hand in hand. Um, with the craft beer and it's just exploded I think from from there and it's not seen you know you'll you'll get a lot of younger generation drinking sort of craft beer and I think that's just helped kind of propel it over the last few years really bit faffy this bit bit faffy Nice one, brother! I don't own it, but uh, put the brakes on, rear mech, shifter, controls basically trying to get the cable lengths right before I start cutting them. It's only the seat post goes internal on this bike, so everything else is so easy. Cable in is sort of the worst thing normally, everything else just bolting bits together, but it's kind of always it's a bit weird, it's a bit underwhelming at first when you finish a bike because everything's at a funny angle. It's only then when you sit on it, get the bar roll, get your grips, get your levers, there's a little bit of finishing and then it's done, but not quite there yet. It is feeling like a bike now. Yes, 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 yes. It's looking good actually. I like the way my wheel graphics match the frame graphics. I've gone for the XC option. Blake's gone for the free ride build with a 164. Cause I've gone 144 carbon rims. So I've gone for the lighter trailer edition. Blake's gone for the free ride hardtail. This is a bike that does everything. This is like the, the Swiss Army knife of rigs. Some of you might know, but I've done a lot on this bike. XC, Enduro, Downhill, uh, all the disciplines on this bike. Bike packing, messing around, bike parks. Here's the Swiss Army knife for bikes. So I'm going to use it for everything, Nick. Everything. You haven't done a commute yet. Yeah, I have. 
I've ridden from my house to the office. I've done that. I've done a commute. Not on video, no, but I have done it. I've done pretty much, and I've used it as a pub bike. I've done it. I've, done, I've, I've used it for everything. Okay. It's safe to say that I, from Mark 1 to Mark 3, this is the, the Mark 3, I've... Uh, I'm, yeah, I've done, I've done all, all everything on a hardtail. I swear by hardtails. So we finished the bike builds, sat back to admire them while sinking a couple of Cali pails and the odd Club Tropicana to get us into the right mindset for a great day's riding tomorrow in the Welsh mountains. Blake, we've headed north from the brewery. We have indeed. Up into the Black Mountains. Big mountain riding on our brand spanking new bikes. They're not looking quite so no. clean and new now, are they? Yeah, keep them dirty, keep them keen, okay, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm riding a 29er, dude. You've qualified. I've qualified for a 29er. Yeah, does that mean I got older? We, well, we definitely have, both of us. But yeah, it's, it's good. It's a tool for the job out it here, isn't it? It's definitely the tool for the job. But a little bit of knowledge for you, Neil. Did you know yeah. that lake right there, Clan Gores? is the largest lake in South Wales. Also the biggest one. It's the highest one, sorry. Biggest. Wikipedia doesn't say it's the biggest, although Gareth, our guy, says it's the biggest. So hey, no, you I, I knew that, not Gareth. <laughs> Don't give him out where my knowledge came from. What a spot. Anyway, we've got to get to the top. We're not, not there yet. As high as we bike. are, we've got to get up there yet. Hi, so. good bike, Neil. 29er. Who would have thunked it? Okay. <laughs> Why do you think mountain bikers love beer? Probably thrill seekers, you know, it, mountain biking, it's, it's, it's a physical sport, quite thrill seeking, a bit of a different breed really. And I think, you know, it's not your kind of football um, loving kind of lager louts. And I, I, I think that's where it kind of comes from really. So there we have it, Neil. Perfect descent to end the day. Sun's going down, so you better be quick. Yeah, we better. It's been a fun couple of days doing a few of my favorite things, building custom bikes. Ooh, and drinking craft beer. And going for a mega ride as well. With mates. Yeah. yeah, it's been amazing. Yeah, leave us a comment down below if you like beer like we do, and give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Yeah.
Shimano has asked me to build another bike, but this time they want me to keep the performance as high as possible and try and keep the price down a little bit. What am I gonna pick, do you reckon? What style of bike is it gonna be? Stay tuned to find out. So previously, I built my interpretation of a cross-country bike that I would ride, and that was based around a Yeti SB100 frame. I put a longer travel fork on it, some bigger tires and that sort of stuff, and yeah, awesome bike. Following that, Shimano asked me to build an ultimate trail bike. Now this was, was easy because I'm a trail bike rider through and through. Uh, so I picked a Mondraker frame and I put a combination of XT, XTR on it, even some Industry 9 wheels. Man, that thing is absolutely smoking. But this time they were like, look, can you just wind it back a bit? You might have gone a bit far on the last one. So what they've asked me to do is build a bike with the highest possible performance, but then really consider where I spend the money on the bike. Now. I'm thinking here, when they tell me this, so I'm thinking of who's the bike gonna be for? What sort of rider needs to save cash and where do they need to save the cash? But I'm also thinking about the product managers that spec on bikes. Because let's face it, when you buy a bike from a manufacturer, whoever that may be, you're gonna get the best possible price on stuff because that manufacturer, when they buy things like Shimano components, they buy in such quantities that the discount that they get when they put the stuff on the bikes enables them to charge you a price for the bike that you can't beat if trying to do the same thing in a custom build. So I'm not trying to build the cheapest bike here by any means. I'm just trying to build a bike that I think represents really good value that offers the best possible ride and most importantly, because I'm not gonna cut any corners in terms of componentry and spec, I'm just gonna be specking things that are readily available uh, around the world, easily sourceable. So, you know, if you're on a riding trip in France, you break something, you can replace that part of the bike, no problem. Uh, and also products that have really good warranties on them, which I think are all things that people look for. Oh, now hopefully that is the frame. Let's have a look. Okay, so the frame I have chosen is a Commercial Meta SX. Uh, I've got a bit of a history of Commercial bikes. I've had several in the past, always loved them, but the key to this particular frame and why I wanna build this is the person it's aimed at. So, could be someone who wants to do a bit of casual uplift riding, a bit of hammering, maybe an enduro race, hitting bike parks and stuff like that. The sort of rider, that doesn't want to have to be replacing parts all the time, the sort of rider that smashes mechs off, the sort of rider that gives wheels loads of punishment, the sort of rider that wants to hit big jumps and session downhill tracks. That is what I'm building this bike for, and it's gonna be a really good, fun build. Now, a bit about the frame. This one is running 160 mil travel on the rear. Well, it will be when I build it. Uh, 170 mil fork is kind of geared for on the front end there. Now, angle-wise, 78 degree seat angle, so good for climbing or winching up to the top. 63 and a half degree on the front there. But the point is, alloy frame, designed to take a hammering, and dare I say it, a very, very cool frame too. Okay, shock absorber then. Now, my original plan was to put this shock on, a Bomber CR. Now, this shock retails for around 315 quid in the UK. It's an absolute bargain. Now, of course, you have to buy a core spring to go with it, but something very important to say is that not all frames are compatible with core shocks. Now, there's a combination of reasons why you won't be able to put one of these on there. Um, when it comes to the linkage of the bike itself. Now, in this particular one, it's got a yoke, so it's like a clever style yoke that drives the shock there. Now, the length of that versus the shock stroke versus the eye to eye, there are three factors that come into account here because you don't want to be putting additional strain on a shock, essentially. So, unfortunately, I can't use this shock on this particular bike. However, I do want to tell you a bit about it because of the fact I think it's such a bargain at the price. So, it's very similar to the original Fox Vanilla RC. Got compression, got damping. Simple shock, very easy for shock tuners to shim and tune this to make it feel as good as the top pro shocks. So if you're looking for a core shock, maybe even a secondary shock for your bike, that is an absolute bargain and worth looking at. So the shock I have chosen though, I've gone for the nearest possible to this, and I've gone for the Marzocchi Bomber Air Shock. Now this one, like the Core Shock, has two basic adjustments on it. You've got rebound and you've got your compression. It also has this asymmetrical, like an almost like an offset piggyback on it, which is quite cool. And one of the reasons they've done this is because the dial they've got to adjust the compression, you can quickly flick it all the way to the right, like a lockout lever. So it's adjustable compression and a lockout almost in one, and hopefully that is gonna fit a treat on this bike. I've designed it to take a hammer in, just like the bike, so let's get it on.
Okay, fork wise, I have gone for a Marzocchi Z1 bomber. It's gonna pair up beautifully with that rear shock on there. And there's a few reasons I've chosen this fork. Uh, well, let's talk about the color first. Let's just be shallow about things. The original Z1 bomber came in that really cool orange color. And obviously they had different colors later on. Uh, this one's available in black or red has to be the red, doesn't it? You need to know that this one is a Z1 bomber. Now it's available in two options, coil sprung and air sprung. I just like the way that you can tune the air spring and it's gonna feel a bit more akin to the back end of the bike. Now the cool thing about this damper is it actually recirculates oil in the lowers. It uses the same lower leg oil as it does in the actual damper, which means it's lubricating the fork the entire time. Now, that's one of the keys to this thing, feeling so good and staying feeling that good. Easily serviceable by any Fox or Marzocchi service agent anywhere in the world. So this one's running 170 mil travel. You can tune it up to 180 or take it down to shorter travel modes. Let's get it on the bike. So I've gone for some pro handlebars. These ones are 800 millimeters wide, five degree up sweep, nine degree back, and a 31.8. So I go along with a the theme of trying to save money but keep performance high. The pro stuff is really good value for money and it's excellent quality. Um, I think the bars are about 35 quid here in the UK and the stem is about the same price. So, crank-wise on this bike, you probably noticed I just put a press fit bottom bracket in. Now, a lot of people have issues with press fit bottom brackets, but the truth is, they work perfectly well. It's all down to the installation. So I use the correct tool for the job there, and it's gonna be fine. Now, this particular crank is a deal, but it's got 30 tooth chainring on there, and I know that the rider on this won't want the 30 on there, so we're swapping it out for a slightly bigger ring. Do like using this system. Nice and simple, splined interface, not like the old days where you used to have uh, multiple chain rings on there and chain ring bolts and stuff like that. So 32 is gonna go on in place. That tool goes in place. Slide it onto here. I like to use it on a vise because I know I can get it nice and tight. Some people prefer to do this with a spanner. One of the things I've always loved about the Shimano bottom bracket system is just that simple preload cap. Now, there's a few different tools you can use for this, but I love using these simple ones. And you literally just have to be careful not to score the crank on the way past, but it just means you can easily preload it and get it just right. I'm picking a largely Dior transmission on the bike. It works excellently. And when you're hammering this stuff, you're obviously going to wear it out as consumable parts. It means it's cheaper to replace. So when you're doing a frame build like this, you want to consider your cable routing before you get stuck into it. Uh, little things like the grommets that go on the actual cable entry ports at the front, you can have single ones or double. So think about how many hoses and cables you're running uh, and obviously go with the minimal because you want it to look nice and neat. Also down the bottom here, they've got little sort of uh, holders to secure the cables in place that will stop them rattling on the inside. So it's key to get things going through. Right, let's get first one in place. We're gonna put the routing in for the rear derailleur and then get the brakes on there. Okay, for my transmission, I've gone for Dior 12 speed. Uh, as explained earlier, chain cassette, uh, crank, chain ring, and rear derailleur. But for the shifter, I've gone for a trusty XT. Now having a really high-end shifter gives you an amazing shifting performance. Don't forget you get the feel from the shifter, the derailleur will perform exactly the same as an XTR. It's just a bit heavier, and we don't care about that for what this bike is gonna be doing. All about the feel though, so you get high performance at the bars. Now I'm mating this up with SLX brakes. 
So the deal brakes are great, but SLX four pots are just that bit better. The finish on them is really good and they're really powerful and they look incredible. They look as good as the XTs, I think. Okay, so time for the wheels. Now, given that this is for a hard hitting bike and also this one is a sort of mixed wheel size, so that's a smaller wheel on the back and a bigger wheel on the front, had to get a dedicated set of wheels. So I've chosen a set of wheels from Hunt, a British company. These ones are enduro wide wheel sets. So they currently make these in 27 and a half and in 29. This is one of the first mixed pairs they're doing. Micro spline hub, obviously, because I'm running Shimano on here. And they've got extra thick T6 axles on them, so really quite burly. That is gonna be a good thing because that's gonna make the bearings last longer because they've got the better support. Rims are 33 mil external, 31 mil internal, also made from T6 alloy. So going for tires I've already got laying around that to be fair, I'm not gonna use. So I've got a good supply of tires. These are 2.6, they're absolutely massive. But I'm gonna be running quite a lot of sealant in here and we're gonna treat the rider to a pair of inserts as well. I've got a few down there. Okay, so here it is, the bruiser of a bike. Now, I've built this deliberately for the sort of uplift style rider, the sort of one that really wants to hammer the Alps and things like that. So hopefully you can see what I've picked on here and my reasoning behind it. Now, as far as price goes, I didn't set a budget. That wasn't the aim of it. It was just to try and build a super bike and make it fairly affordable. Now, I use for affordable and inverted commas because you can buy one of these off the peg for just under 3,400 quid in the UK and it's amazing value. And like I said at the beginning of the video, you can't really beat that sort of thing. But looking at online pricing, like not the retail pricing of these, uh, online pricing, I've priced this up as 3595, not including the tires, the saddle, or the grips. The grips were mine, so let's just leave that alone. Uh, tires, the same thing. Again, tires are gonna be a generic price anywhere, whatever, and the saddle, Full disclaimer, Physique sent me a saddle for the Mondraker video for the, the other bike build and they actually sent it twice. So I just chucked it on here because I had a spare one. Um, but there you go. The aim wasn't to do it as cheap as possible, but it was to make a bike that's hopefully got really sensible decisions. So it's got burly wheels on it and they're alloy rims. So even if they do get creased when you're hitting stuff, you're gonna be fine with them. Of course, they're regular spokes, so easy to repair. The transmission speaks for itself. Dior is excellent. It's 12 speed, so you're gonna be great for up and down. Easy to replace. You're not gonna cry when you smash that rear mech. Suspension, 
absolutely brilliant. You can get these serviced anywhere in the world. You can get parts for them anywhere in the world. And these things will keep on trucking. They are excellent front and rear. Um, same cockpit, no frills, and it's got really good anchors on it. Four pot SLX. But unfortunately, I'm not gonna be riding this one. Someone else is gonna take it for a proper thrashing. Thanks, Doddy. We're here in Finale Liguri, the birthplace of Enduro. Known for its loose, rough, rocky trails, the perfect place to put a bike through its paces. Powerful brakes and quality suspension are essential for riding this sort of terrain at speed and should keep me upright. Done and dusted here in Finale Ligure. And you know what? I have properly put this bike to its limits. So first up, thank you Shimano for sending over some great components to build it up with. It just goes to show that you don't need an all singing, all dancing bike to go out and hammer those trails and really have some fun. You can build a great bike up on a budget and absolutely ride any trail that you want to. So we're done, we're out of it. Let me know what you thought in the comments down below. But for now, I'm out. Thanks a lot everyone and I'll see you next time. Now I spend a lot of time aboard XC bikes here at the channel and I'm pretty lucky. They're normally pretty fancy with some all singing, all dancing parts on it. But you know what, it got me thinking, that's not really obtainable for a lot of people and I get that, bikes are expensive. So I was thinking, can you build an ultimate cheap XC bike? So I took a little bit of inspiration from Neil on this one who did a very similar video but with a downhill bike and it was flipping amazing. And after trawling the internet looking for some absolute bargains, I've come up with this. This is what I've come up with then, a Scott Scale 50, roughly 2012, and I found it on eBay. The guy who was selling it luckily lived fairly close by, and he just used it as a pub kind of run around bike. Having said that though, I think it's a great starting point to able to convert into a really good bike. I mean, we're gonna have to change some parts. So it's running an old school three by nine group set. There's a front mech on it. I've not seen one of those in God knows how many years. It's 26 inch wheels, very narrow bars. There's 600 wide bars. There's no dropper or anything like that. Nothing's internally rooted. But I do believe that this could make a very good and still competitive XC bike for a very cheap price. Okay, well, do you know what? I think it's time we start upgrading and improving this bike. I've got some really good bits that I'm gonna put on it and we're gonna run through why and what I've chosen and how much as well, because that's gonna be a real crucial thing. So we're gonna have a little money counter up in the corner of the screen there. But let's get it stripped and let's get cracking. Whoa. Say goodbye, nine speed. So if this bike's looking a bit familiar to you, well then it's a bit old school, but Nino Schurter actually rode a 26 inch carbon version of the scale around the 2011, 2012 season, just as 29 as were starting to overtake. He was still rocking like I said, that carbon framed one of these. So it's race proven, but it's old school again. Like I said, there's no internal route and nothing like that. So we're gonna undo these cable clamps under here. It does make it very easy to work on at least. So that is a bonus. Let's get cracking on these. This is an absolute spaghetti junction of cables going on here. That's one cable less from the front mech. We're not gonna need that. So that cleans things up a little bit. Okay, Ooh. old grip, not needed. Let's get that one off. Oh, okay, so there we go. Look, we got a bit of interference. 
That's only gonna get worse when I do what I'm gonna do to the front here. Right, brakes are going, one of the shifters is going, we're gonna get some new grips on there, and these bars definitely have to go. 600 mil wide is proper old school. So let's strip the front end of this, get it all off, and then the bike is gonna be kind of almost at its bare minimum. So let's crack on with this. Right, here's what we're dealing with. So these brakes are gonna get replaced, which we'll get to, but the pads in this back caliper are literally upside down. So that's coming off. Right, I'm reusing this crank set or chain set if you like because I can just remove the three chain rings and replace it for something else. So here we have it then, the bike is pretty much stripped. Uh, back to basics, bottom bracket still in. That was actually running quite smooth so I'm gonna reuse that, that can be left in and maybe just repack it full of grease. And the same with the headset. I mean, the headset is running pretty good. It's not silky smooth, but it's not all notchy and gritty. It still works absolutely fine. So we're gonna start at the front of the bike. Now, the first upgrade I have made to this bike is a new set of forks. Now, you're probably thinking, Rich, that is quite an expensive upgrade. And sometimes you might be right. I actually managed to get these for free from the local bike shop. I went in, I fancied me chance. I said, look, have you got anything, any old forks knocking around, anything like that? And they were like, well look, we've got these and we were literally gonna scrap them. A pair of RockShot Rebus from a similar year, correct size steerer length, straight inch and eighth all the way through. Straight swap, we'll have a look, we'll take this out, re-grease the headset, pop those back in, and then we'll move on to the cockpit. Okay, next up, these bars, like I said, 600s, those have got to go. Okay, do you know what? In hindsight, I've had a little look and this stem is monstrous. So, bit of a blag this one. So again, zero cost, but I've managed to go and dig one out of the workshop here at work. So that is free. So that money counter doesn't need to go up just yet. So we're still stuck on that 250 mark. You can see the difference in bar length. Look, look at that. Old school, new school, again. I've been saying it, but look, these were blagged to get from the local bike shop. So where I got the, my forks from, this was just, these were essentially in their scrap metal bin. And we're just gonna go out 700 wide. There's a fair old back sweep on them, but I think they're gonna do perfect for this build. If you wanted, you can hunt around and you can get like cheap carbon flat bars online, eBay, places like that for like 20 quid. So free or very cheap. Either way, it still doesn't add up our tally. Right, now check out these beauties. I think braking is key here and it's somewhere we can save a bit of weight as well. Old school Avid XO. Carbon levers, I think these were? 60 quid off Facebook Marketplace for the pair, including 160 mil rotors. So that is now taking our total up to 310 pounds. Cha-ching! But look, let's get those fitted. They've got good pads in them still. They don't need bleeding because they weren't inter internally rooted, so they should slot straight on. Okay, the pitfalls of buying online then. You gotta be careful. Buying and just having it posted is a risk, obviously. I got these brakes and they're wicked, but that front hose, way too short look. So that there is definitely not reaching and I don't have any hose here. So that thing is gonna have to stay off for now, but it does mean it'll look like a sick dirt jump bike for the meantime. Anyway, let's carry on 
with the cockpit. So now I think we've got the brake on. We can't set that up till the wheel's in in a bit. I reckon it's time to upgrade the transmission, if you like, the group set. So this had a three by nine group set on it before. Out with the old, we're going one by. Yes, I managed to get a really cheap one by narrow wide chainring. I've got a brand new, this is the only brand new parts really that are going on this bike. One by 10 speed, again, Shimano Dior group set, which will fit to the wheels I've got, which we will get to. And really that's gonna bring it up to sort of modern standards. It's still an 1146, I'll have to double check on the box in a minute, ratio cassette. So still a pretty big old range of gear in there. And it just means it's gonna save weight and it's gonna look a lot cleaner. So let's get putting that on. We're doing the whole group set. So, you know what, the shifter comes with a fresh outer. And I should have said, for our tally total, this is another 117 pounds for the mech, the cassette, the shifter, and the chain. Right, let's get putting that bad boy on. Right, these are what I reckon the biggest bargain I found on Marketplace. Check out these DC Swiss rims on Hope Pro 2 hubs. And there's, I mean, listen to that. All right, it's not as silky smooth as what it used to be, but I mean, guess how much this set me back? 35 quid a pair, 26 inch, quick release, six bolt. They're exactly what I was looking for. 19 mil internal, so they're pretty bloomin' narrow, but they're way lighter than the wheels that were on there. They're gonna need a bit of truing up, just a bit of TLC on them, but I mean, they're absolutely perfect. For this sort of old school XC build, you can't really get any better. So let's get them cleaned up a little, get the uh, rotors, get the cassette on, and start getting that on the bike. So I was gonna go tubeless on this, because that would be sort of keeping up with the times, but to keep the cost down, I wanted to reuse the tires that came on it because they're in good nick. They still got the hairs on the side sort of thing. So we're going to stick with tubes. Now, if you did want to go tubeless, I reckon you could do it 40, 50 quid all in, having to get new tires as well. 26 inch tires are pretty cheap nowadays. Bit of sealant, you could use some uh, Gorilla Tape as your rim tape and some cheap tubeless valves. So yeah, I reckon you could do it for about 50 quid. But as it is, this hasn't cost me anything because I can reuse the tubes and the tyres. Quite a relief. Right, grips then, they are from an old bike of mine. So these tasty little Ergon numbers can slide straight on there, looking good. Clamp them up tight. All right, check it out, it's taking shape nicely. So wheels are on, we're starting to get group sets on. There's sort of something resembling a proper cockpit on there. So now what I'm gonna do is we're gonna get the cranks and that on and convert it properly to that one by Group set, so I've given it a little clean up. Bottom bracket still feels pretty good. I'm happy with that. Save a few pennies, it doesn't need to be replaced at, at the moment. So let's get our new chainring on. In fact, have a look at this. Eight pounds for a narrow wide chainring. Brand spankers in the pack as well. Unreal, so we're gonna put that onto our existing cranks and get that chain on and we should be good to go. Right, the perils of neglected old bikes, some of the bolts are seized. So trying to get this seat off to replace the seat for a way fancier one I've got. I mean, this bolt here is just not turning. I think it's not a good sign. Maximum effort here, watch this. Oh, okay. We're, we're walking a fine line between rounding the bolt and getting it out, but I always like to walk that fine line. Yes. 
There we go. Have a look at this and this I reckon is the most expensive blag on the entire bike. It's a Selle Italia XLR saddle with manganese rails. And now these saddles, I think they're like 120 quid normally. This is an X test saddle. So, you know, it's basically new. It's just sat in the local bike shop again. But he was like, I was like, oh, Tony, you got any saddles? He's like, get on, you can have one of these for 15 quid. So I was like, oh, bangers. Oh, bangers. So stick 15 pounds up in the tally, please. And we are still well under 500 quid all in for this bike. But we'll get to that in a little bit. Let's get this on and we're nearly there. Here it is, people, the final finished product. And what a beauty it is. I am well chuffed with how this has come out. This has come at sub 500 quid. If you'd have thought, could you build an XC bike for under 500 quid, you definitely wouldn't think it looks like that. I mean, it's basically a Nino shirt, a replica, isn't it? So let's run through it a quick a minute then. So basically the major components have been upgraded. So, you know, some stunning wheels for a really good price, which run fine. Quick true, quick check over, but they're still really good. Much lighter, save a lot of weight there as well. The forks, the old ones were blown and knackered. They were no good. And I was given these for free. Crazy. So it just goes to show a few out there do go and wander around the bike shops. There is stuff out there. And it was a straight swap. Steerer, tube length, travel, amazing. The newest parts, or the only new parts that were really brought was the drivetrain, a complete drivetrain here bar the cranks for a one by 10 over a three by nine. Now what this is gonna do is save some weight, less faff on mechanical parts, moving parts, and just bring it a bit more in line with what a modern XC bike is like. And it's unreal. And then, do you know what? All the final finishing touches, the things like the wider bars, the lighter, better brakes now. Obviously, we're still missing the front brake at the, at the moment. So stay tuned, because this bike will be in future videos where it will definitely have a front brake and maybe even a dropper because I'm looking at it now and I think this could do with a dropper. So stay tuned. Would you like to see this bike in more videos? Maybe some comparisons? Do you think I should race it? Do you think I should take this to an XC race? Well, let, let me know in the comments down below. It's been really fun building this one and it just goes to show that you don't need all the money, all the bells and whistles to build up a really great bike, especially if you're just getting into the sport. So look, here it is. Enjoy people and I'll catch you next time. Welcome back you beautiful people and welcome to another Blake Builds episode where I am going to put my welding skills together and I am going to build a hardtail bike, a frame. Yeah, how hard can it be to build your own mountain bike in your garage? It's getting hard now, really hard. No going back now, man. Ha ha ha! Oh no. <laughs> My plan in this video is to build a bike from scratch. What could possibly go wrong? I've built a work stand, a manual machine, a side hack, ultimate bike cave, and for some stupid reason, a human balance bike. Ever since I could remember, I've wanted to do this, and today is the day. And it all starts with some basic mild steel tubing. Okay, so the materials I'm using for this build, for the frame, is just mild steel piping. Now, when it comes to mountain bikes or any bicycle frame making, they use seamless tubing, which makes it a lot stronger. This has got a seam all the way, so it's you know it's prone to crack down under super stress. Which, to be honest, I'm not too worried about it. I'm on a budget, and all of this just I, I think it came to about I don't know 100 100 pounds. So I got a number of bits of tube in here. Uh, that will be the top tube. This will be my seat seat tube. Uh, this will be my down tube. I did think I would go and stick a big fat one, but it's going to be heavy this bike and I don't want it to be too too heavy so kind of eliminated this one 
And then these ones here are 16 mil tube, and this is gonna be my seat stays and my chain stays. So I've got some of them, uh, and I've got little bits down here, and then I've got this tiny little tube right here. This was gonna be my, um, like my little gussets that, that go between the ch ch chain stays, give a little, little bit of a uh, strength, but I'll see. So this is the steel I'm using. That, now this big fat plate here, six mil, uh, that is gonna be for my, um, dropouts on the rear for those aluminium things to bolt to because uh, yeah I am not haven't got uh, a, like a I haven't, I haven't just haven't got all their tools so I'm just gonna use that and I'm gonna use that and then just drill some holes and put it in there this is the material I'm gonna be using for this build mild steel for the bicycle okay I hear you I hear you what does bicycle mean it means bicycle in Shona, which is the language they speak in my home country of Zimbabwe. So, I did a little bit of homework on uh, the frames I like, and um, obviously the frame I do love is the uh, Nukeproof Scout. So, I've got a few dimensions from that. Uh, I, you know what, I'm going to try and stick to it. It probably will not end up looking like the Scout, but hey. What I did notice when I was looking at that little drawing you get on the website is that um, everything works off the BB. So I'm going to work off the BB as much as I can. Right, get some angles going. Done my BB. I'm going to work from that. Hopefully, I don't make a mistake. But we can always see. Right, more time lapse. Okay, it's like just gone past 8 p.m. Uh, it's taken me pretty much all day faffing. I made a mistake. The, the head angle was totally out. It was ridiculous. So I thought, go back to the drawing board, draw it up again. I had a quick phone call with Robert Nukeproof just to uh, help me out and understand how the drawing goes, where it starts from and blah, 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 and how to put this there and <sighs> learning curve. I'm stoked. I can't wait now to cut all the steel, kind of measure it up again, cut it up and start welding and let's uh, let's start making this first triangle. I'm gonna start with the front one because I feel like that's the easiest one because the rear, you're gonna be doing some bending and stuff, you know, tire clearance, we need it. I started to cut up an old bottom bracket and head tube as the base of my frame. Is the seat tube. I'm just going to cut all the tubes to uh, to the right length because before I start welding them all together I need to put in all the little accessories that I need to do now before doing it whilst it's all welded up. That makes sense because it will be super hard to do all the little trinkets on the frame when it's fully built because I won't be able to get in there. So I'm going to do that all before doing the welding. Down tube. Next step is to drill a hole and add a cap for the dropper post and also make some tabs for a bottle cage. Oh. Bottle cage bolts. In. Yes! 
now we can start notching the tubes and uh, putting in bottom brackets and stuff. <laughs> Just that is done by eye. You can't just, oh, it's, it's disgusting. But it works, it works. Uh, that is perfect, perfect fit. Look at that, oh my gosh. Anyway, all right, now I'm just gonna match this up. Spot weld it. Make sure it's all level. Then match it up to the drawing. And if it matches the drawing, like, good enough, I think it will be good enough. I tacked the down tube to the BB and after a quick check against the drawing, it was spot on. I've come to uh, the head tube, which is uh, a bit scary. <laughs> Did you like my jig? So these are just magnets, and to be honest, they're working out okay. For now, they're probably, it's, yeah, it's, it's okay, it's okay. Now it's time to weld this guy onto here, level, and hopefully, the head angle is good. I'll offer it up to the drawing when this is tacked on. Do I make a jig to make that straight or do I just do it by eye? <laughs> well, here's a garage build. Do I just do it by eye? Or do I do it professionally? How can I do it professionally, Blake? You have no tools. Professional tools. Holy moly. That's not straight. Cut! 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 That was totally unacceptable, dude. Oh! Ah. Oh no. <laughs> this is difficult now. I'm so worried. I'm just like trying to be so, so, well, perfect, but it's not, is it? because I haven't got a jig and I'm just balancing the head tube of a bike in the air. Let's try, let's, let's try that again. Head tube is on. Let's just hope it, uh, it's kind of straight. I'm gonna take it to the, the drawing. I'll give us a uh, rough idea that it's in the right place and the right head angle. Hey! After a couple duff attempts at welding the head tube on, we got there in the end. Nice and straight-ish. Nice and straight-ish. <laughs> Whose idea was this? How hard it is, how hard is it to build a frame in your garage? Really hard. We should crack on. This is um, all tacked up. Front triangle. Let's move on to the rear triangle which I feel like is going to be even more of a headache. Even more of a headache. I'm learning so much. Okay, the next step is the triangle, but before I start cutting the tubes and trying to bend them in, into place and stuff, I'm gonna make the dropouts for where these are gonna bolt to. So I've got this six mil plate. I'm gonna trace around this, and then I'm gonna add a little bit of steel up here, blah, 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 and probably add some bits like this, so I can uh, add, you know, weld the tubes to it. And um, yeah, this part here is gonna be the easiest part, to be honest. I just gotta cut two exactly the same. This is going to be the easiest part. The hardest part is bending the tubes and, oh my gosh, it's getting hard now, really hard. And I thought the front triangle was hard. 
Okay, this part is absolute crucial. Actually, everything on this bike is crucial, but this bit right here, I just quickly cut this, and um, it is totally wrong, totally wrong, because I rushed into it, and it's all skew if. so this cut here is not very straight, this cut here is not very straight. So, I rushed out, and I bought myself a a pipe cutter. Now this thing cuts pipe to the straightest of everything, which is amazing. And I need that because this needs to be straight. Absolutely needs to be straight. Okay, drop parts in. I'm gonna put this all together. I'm gonna start cutting and bending and doing the rear triangle which is going to be a hell of a task i keep saying it. i am just i'm tired now because of this thing you know, i've only done the front triangle but this is day three it doesn't look like it this is day three and you go oh, oh. let's get this thing kind of complete now my first job was to cut a new dummy axle for the rear triangle jig. And then I set out to make the rest of the jig and cut and bending my chain stays, which uh, took a while. Oh, <laughs> yes, that is an absolute milestone. An absolute milestone. Wow, the chain stay is in. I don't know if it's level or anything, but if it looks, it looks really good. It looks level-ish to my eyes. But if you were to put it in a jig, hell, dude, this thing will be like spaghetti, man. It's all wobbly. Right, but I, I am so chuffed with that. This is perfect. That is so good. That there fits in amazing there. There's no massive gaps. That is just so good to start welding on, but I'm not going to do that yet. I'm going to put my... Uh, other one on right here which I need to still cut a groove in it just like this one right here uh, this one's been beveled whatever it is I don't know what you call it but that's to go in there I just need to chop this a bit make it the right length and then holy moly mother of Moses do it I'm building a bike in my garage and it's not easy but it is fun <laughs> Let's do this side and then get on to the seat stays because, dude, that just looks like a bicycle straight away. There's no going back now, man. Ha ha ha, snap. So I worked till the early more early hours of the morning last night, and uh, it's the next day. But hey, we're not going by days, even though this is day four. Anyway, now the frame is complete. Look at this. I even I I had uh, I just couldn't resist putting on my bottle cage and bottle in there. It, it just looks it, it looks like a mountain bike now, but cable uh, routing, cable organization. That's what I'm doing right now. And uh, I came up with a cool idea. Uh, yeah, you might not like it, but I've got some M6 nuts or M5 nuts. And uh, that there, the internal diameter of that is the perfect external diameter of a brake hose. So I'm gonna weld these little guys all along wherever I need them. 
so I can run uh, my cables through them without cable ties. Boom! Nuts! Not boom, cable ties, boom, nuts. <laughs> so I'm going to weld these all up in uh, some good areas so my cables stay in one area. So that's what I'm going to do now. <laughs> Look at that though. Look at that. That's a bottle cage. I made that go there. I made it. I didn't buy a bike with it there. I made it. I can't believe I'm making a bike. After the cable routing, I started on my seat clamp, which in the end needed two bolts to work. Okay, this is the last bit of welding, and it's just this. Little tube, little gusset. That little gusset is gonna go in there just like that. It's just gonna add a little bit more strength to the rear triangle. And hopefully it doesn't flex as much. But that guy's gonna go in there, and then it's, uh, well, it's time to assemble the rig. I, c I can't wait. Right, let's weld this in and then build it and then I'll do a grand reveal because you probably don't want to see the build. So I'll just go, voila, and here it is. Look at it. I'm still speechless on how this thing has turned out. It looks like a bicycle. Well, it is a bicycle. I actually made a bicycle. I made a bike. I made a bike. I, <laughs> I made a bicycle. Look at it, man. I'm still admiring how crazy, like all these bends. It took me ages to do all this. Welding is not the best. But look at that. I built my first ever mountain bike, hardtail, 29 inch wheels with 150 mil of travel on the front. And it, it, it works, it rolls. One thing I haven't done is, is tested it, which I cannot wait to go and do. I'm gonna go bike packing on this thing, two day trip, and that is gonna give it the ultimate test. I'm gonna strap bags to it. I'm gonna go out there, spend a night, and just reminisce on how much I struggled to build this bike. It was the absolute head scratcher. I learned a lot when I was when I was building this. Now, when I drew it up, I kind of went off the same ge same geometry and lengths and diameters and whatever from my Nukeproof Scout, and I thought I'd kind of stick to it. So the seat stay on this was going to be 440. It's actually a little bit longer. It's 442. Uh, the rear is, uh, you know, it's supposed to be dead straight. Kind of not. It just aims to the left a little bit, leans over there slightly. Now with the head angle, it was a 64, what I was going for. This has come out at a 62, 63, in between the two. So that's not too bad. 14.4 kilograms, the whole bike. 3.8 kilograms just for the frame. So there you go. I built a bike, a mountain bike in my garage. It was uh, hard, head scratchingly hard. I uh, struggled with some bits, I made mistakes, but hey, kind of goes to, uh, kind of go to appreciate how much it's, it takes to make a mountain bike. The bike that you're riding is taking years and years of R&D and all those people designing it, coming up with the best geometries and all that, whew, kind of just like hits home on what bike you've got in your possession. What you ride is, uh, is special. This is special. Oh, I can't, I can't believe it. Thank you very much for watching this rad video. Stick around because the next one is me going bikepacking on this bike and hopefully it stays in one piece and doesn't snap. If it does, I just come back and I just weld it again. Maybe put a gusset there or something. Thank you very much. See ya. I'm actually gonna go and test it. I haven't even done that. See ya.